Welcome to the Open Forum. Again, we have the profound privilege, the wonderful privilege of looking together into the Word of God to discover truth. And this is a very special evening because it's exactly seven months from Judgment Day, seven months from the completion of God's whole salvation plan for the human race, because on that day, on May 21, next year, it, uh, all of the true believers will, their bodies will be raptured up and they will go to be with Christ, uh, to begin reigning with Him in a new heaven and a new earth. And what an awesome day that is and what an awesome idea. It seems way beyond uh, anything we can imagine. It, it sounds fairy tale. It sounds uh, like we're just trying to be spectacular. It, uh, but you know, the, bio, the, wor the world has to come to an end. The Bible indicates that. And uh, it just happens to be that we're living at that time when it is coming to an end. Whether we like it or don't like it, it will happen because God never, never, never makes commitments unless he carries them out. When he told Noah about the exact date when the flood waters would come back there 7,000 years ago, that is when the flood waters did come. And uh, when he, uh, whenever God pr makes any kind of a plan, he is the in eternal God. He knows he is absolutely capable of accomplishing what he commits himself to. And therefore, we know that when we have all the proofs that God has given us concerning May 21, we know that it is God is telling us that the Bible, that God himself, who wrote the Bible, is guaranteeing it that it will happen. But this is your program. We want to hear from you, whatever your subject might be, whatever your question may be. And so, shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Welcome to the Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Yes, because you speak right into your phone. Yes, Brother Camping. I would like to know where you got the uh, year 4990 for the flood, how you came about that, please. Thank well, you. Well, it was not easy. I worked, uh, I worked uh, uh, without uh, any exaggeration, I worked a full five years uh, studying, uh, cramming every hour I could make uh, in looking at the Bible and comparing Scripture with Scripture and and uh, checking and double checking until finally I arrived at the and this was already oh, more than 40 years ago I arrived at the date of uh, uh, of uh, the year of uh, 11,013 B.C. for creation and 4990 for the flood of Noah's day and then I spent the next 10 years uh, investigating anything that science had to offer, like carbon, for t carbon dating or potassium argon dating or and, and anything at all, the uh, increase in the uh, in the sediments in the seafloor, just to see is somehow is there anything in the secular record that would uh, that would show that it cannot be 11,013. And I, uh, all, I couldn't find a thing. In fact, all I did find uh, was more, more proof. And so finally, uh, uh, back about 35 years ago, I wrote a book called Adam Wynn and laid out all that information, uh, so that anybody at all could read it and, uh, and critique it. And uh, there were a few that did critique it and, and I, I would look at what they had to offer to make sure that they had not found something that I had missed because all I want is truth and it stood the test. It has been around now for about 40 years and I have never, never seen any evidence from any source at all that it was not done correctly. And then 
when we a couple of years ago when we learned that it was exactly 7,000 years later that uh, all the evidence in the Bible uh, uh, shows that 7,000 la years later uh, the world would come to an end in 2011 and that was indicated in Second Peter chapter 3 verse 8 as what God uh, had planned then I knew that by God's mercy by God's mercy not because we are so smart or anything at all but he had carefully guided this whole study so that indeed we know that 4990 has to be the date if it had if I had come at that time up with a date like 4995 or or 4860 or something like that then I would have known that all of our dating uh, that we going all the way to 2011 is suspect uh, maybe there are other errors but because it all tied together perfectly I knew that God had guided this and not because of any wisdom on our part or anybody's part but God had guided this and therefore it is absolutely uh, going to happen that in seven months from today we will have uh, the beginning of Judgment Day. Thank you, Brother Camby. Have a Thank good Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hal, where in the Bible does it say that God told Noah the exact date? Wasn't does it around it about that eventually it's going to happen? Oh, we read, uh, first of all, he... If we go to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, we, and we can, uh, uh, he, he, in Genesis, uh, he, God gave him a time of 120 years. Uh, mankind shall be 100 and, let me look at that verse there. Uh, and we read that, uh, 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 the Lord said in verse 3 of Genesis 6, uh, My spirit, that is, Jehovah said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And when we search the Bible for any information about that hundred and twenty years, we know it had nothing to do with the lifespan, because Noah, for example, continued to live till he was 950 years, and his son Seth was hundreds and hundreds of years old, and so on. So we, or, 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 or Shem, rather, uh, uh, and so we know that has to be focused on the time God gave Noah uh, to prepare the ark. And then finally, finally, uh, we read in Genesis chapter 7 that finally God said now uh, in verse 1 come thou and all thy house into the ark for I have seen uh, right, uh, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation and then he said for in verse 4 for yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights and uh, so we read that uh, 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 in uh, they all went into the ark the, in verse 12, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and his wives, they and all the beasts of the field. And uh, they went in, in verse 16, so as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And it it was it, it and we read back in verse eleven that uh, uh, verse ten it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth, and so it all is God really uh, emphasized this is the precise day, and it did happen exactly on that day, and because God is whenever God makes a commitment. He is God. He's infinite God. He can make absolutely certain that that commitment will be carried out perfectly. And this is one demonstration of that. But how? There's 365 days in the 120th year. 
Well, there's a hundred and, uh, 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 the hundred and twentieth year. God is not telling us what month it's going to be, but, but, uh, by that time, uh, seven days before the flood, you know full well that the ark was completed. It was all completed because there would be no building during that last seven days. It would mean that all the cattle, remember, and all the beasts of the field, uh, uh, had been coming uh, to the ark uh, two by two uh, and that again uh, would have to be unorchestrated by God because no human being could find every beast all over that huge continent that existed in that day and uh, they were there ready to go two by two into the ark and they clean animals seven pairs uh, into the ark and Noah had seven days to get them in. And you can also rest assured that most of the people, if not all the people that lived in the world on that day, maybe as many as a million, uh, would have been watching all this with, with uh, 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 tremendous astonishment, seeing all these animals come there and seeing all of them uh, faithfully uh, going into the ark because uh, God had to, had arranged this because there's no way that uh, uh, Noah and his family could have uh, done all of, uh, made all those wild animals obedient to go into that door in the ark. It had to be under the care of God. And then, sure enough, sure enough, seventh day, the flood waters came. And so we have. Uh, God has given a lot of detail. He's even told him, told us what the date was that uh, of that uh, uh, the biblical date for that particular year. It was the seventeenth day of the second month. But thank you for calling and sharing, and and that's why, that's why when we have worked through the whole t- timeline of history and. T- and so very, very carefully, and in the process of working that out, we've seen many, many interesting uh, 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 relationships between various numbers and so on, but nothing that absolutely guaranteed that there could not have been an error some way until we got the commitment from God that there are exactly 7,000 years from the day of the flood until the uh, till the time of the uh, the uh, judgment day, and even it it even developed that God gave us the seventeenth day of the second month of the biblical calendar of Noah's day, and He modified that biblical calendar a little bit uh, at uh, a time at the time Israel came out of Egypt thousands of years later, uh, but and that can that biblical calendar still stands today. And then we discover that May 21, 2011 is also the 17th day of the second month of the biblical calendar of our day. My, my, uh, how could anything be more uh, astonishing except that it's all done by God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Second Peter chapter three, verse three and four. Second Peter chapter three, verse three and four. Let's look at that. There we discover. Knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now, what is your question? Okay, now, in Jude verse 16, it also talks about murmurers and complainers walking out their own lusts, and I was wondering, can this refer to maybe a, a version of the gospel that 
doesn't have anything to do with Judgment Day. Uh, Jude 16, we read that these are murmurers, complainers, uh, walking after their own lusts and their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage, but beloved, remember, ye, the words which are spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they were told you, uh, how, how that they told you there would be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. And, and this, uh, this, of course, is uh, also talking about uh, our day when people are mocking this whole idea. But it's, they, there's been mocking of the Bible uh, uh, at various times throughout the history of the world, but it's particularly outstandingly in view in our day, particularly when we begin to talk about such things as a date for the end of time, and people don't want to hear that at all. And their spiritual eyes have not been opened, and that's why we should just feel sorry for these folk and pray for them. But their spiritual eyes have not been opened, and so they think the whole thing is ridiculous, and there's mocking and scoffing, but it doesn't change the fact that it will happen. Uh, mankind, with all of their... Uh, unbelief and uh, uh, inability to understand the Bible do not change what God has taught in the Bible. And when we begin to find harmony between all kinds of verses that heretofore have not appeared to be harmonious, then we know God has opened our eyes. We do have truth. And that's what, uh, that's why we have such a stern and serious command that we have to warn the world that May 21, 2011 is Judgment Day. Of course, by God's mercy, and I, I, I do want to add this, at the same time, the Bible is assuring us that right through today and all the way up to May 21 next year, God is st still saving people, not in the churches, but outside, one, there are those who are still coming into the kingdom of God, and that's all together. God's business. We don't know who they are or where they are, but it is. Uh, the Bible speaks of a large crowd or a great multitude. So on the word lust, Mr. Camping? I'm sorry? So when, when, when someone walks after their own lust, can that have anything to do with the gospel, or is it just like food and drink and other things? Oh, no. Uh, the word lust is coveting, and uh, what does man covet? Man covets this world. Uh, not only the sin of this world, but anything in this world. This is their, this is their home. This is what they feel that uh, they have worked hard for. They want more land. They want a bigger house. They want more jewelry. They may want one more freedom, whatever. They, they, uh, this world is where the action is. Come on, don't tell me about uh, their thinking. Don't tell me about what God is going to do. Uh, this world, look how solid it is. Uh, one day follows another. This has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And it's just going to keep going. And, and sure, we're having problems with, with, uh, uh, different things with uh, pollution and and what have you, but we can solve that. Give us enough time. We mankind is very smart, and uh, they make new discoveries all the time. We'll solve that, and so they just are convinced that this whole business about, about what we're teaching from the Bible is just nonsense. It's nothing to take be taken seriously, but. It is to be taken seriously because God wrote the Bible for you and for me and for these individuals who are mocking the Bible or scoffing or scorning, uh, uh, being scornful of the Bible uh, so that we might be warned what is going to happen because it is absolutely going to happen. The Bible guarantees it. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? 
Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Canty. Um, the verse that you just read about um, there will be my, um, scoffers uh, uh, saying, where, where is the promise of his coming? I was wondering about this verse uh, connected to that. Ro Romans 4, verse 16. Romans 4, let's look at that. Romans 4, verse 16. There we read, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which also is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now this, of course, is speaking directly about salvation. Faith has to do with Christ, who did all the work. He is the faithful one who did all the work to save us. And he, it was his faith that makes possible the salvation of those that God planned to save. And uh, that... Uh, uh, well, I was looking at the um, where it says, the, to the end, the promise might be sure. Well, the end of promise, of course, is uh, the rapture of the believers, because that is when our salvation is completed. When we are saved, we already have been received, uh, we already have received an eternal soul in which we will... Uh, never sin again in which, in which we're going to go into heaven but we can look at the human race and we don't see any of those eternal souls we don't we can't we can that's a spirit activity that's going on in that person and and we can't see that at all uh, but and so but but God is simply saying yes okay but it's going to happen that the promise will be completed and and God has laid out the plan very, very carefully, exactly the way he's going to do it, and that is that the promise of salvation will, that is the final completion of salvation, which has to do with the salvation of the bodies of those who he had already made payment for uh, the sins of, uh, that will also absolutely take place. On can, can you May also, 21. Can you also compare that to Galatians 3.22? Galatians 3.22. There are Galatians 3.22. Let's return to that. Galatians 3.22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And the only ones that believe are the ones that God gives that faith to because we will not, we will not, uh, our own faith can, is a good work and, we, and our good works cannot have anything to do with helping us to get saved. Only the, the uh, if anyone believes, uh, it is because God has given him salvation. That is, if he believes unto salvation. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hello, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. You know what? Let me just turn my radio down here. Okay. Um, yeah, Mr. Camping, I've learned a lot from you over the past several years, and I really appreciate your knowledge uh, and your uh, love uh, of the I'm Bible. S I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Would you be kind enough to repeat your question and speak right into your phone so we'll be uh, able to yeah. hear it? Yeah. Hi, Mr. Camping. Can you hear me okay now? Let's try it. Okay. I've learned a lot from you over the past several years, and I really do appreciate your love and your knowledge of the Bible and I'd like to offer a few verses for you to read to show the sinfulness of mankind and also the great mercy and the hope that he, that he has given us. Could you please read 1 
Corinthians 6. One, uh, and, uh, you have a question about 1 Corinthians chapter 6, six verse, yeah, first, verse first, eight, 8 and 9. 9 to 11. For our first Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11. We'll read these and then you can ask your question. Well, first Corinthians want... 6, verse 9 to 11. Know ye not that the right, unrighteous right. shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Is that the passage? Uh, uh, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, what is your question about this? this in other words, here God is saying it very plainly that God has done all the work to save us and he came for sinners. Christ came for Sinners, not good people, but sinners. They could, and and uh, uh, but if he make if he has saved them, it means that Daddy. every one of those sins was laid upon him before the foundation of the world. Now, did you have a question? Now, and we're going to go to our next caller. And thank you for calling All and right. sharing. And shall we take our next call? Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. God, God bless you tonight. Yes, go ahead with your question. Yes, sir. I had a question on Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 25, sir. And getting back to Noah's uh, time where uh, God saved his people along with the animals, I had a question uh, concerning... Uh, hold on, hold on. Excuse me. We have to pause for this message. We're continuing with our open forum, and I want to remind all of us that, that please, uh, we would like each one to ask just one question. We have so many people trying to call in, and please, uh, in fairness to all the others, would you please just offer one question and only call in no more than once a month. Now, we have a caller who has a question about Noah and a question about Isaiah. Which one do you want us to consider? Well, well, actually, sir, chapter chapter Isaiah sixty five seventeen to twenty five. I wanted to have a response on particular verse twenty five, where it says, "The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw with the yes. bullock." Would that mean? That in the new earth, that God would would create new animals the way He in, first intended them to I, be. I, I understand your question. Uh, you see, God spoke in parables. God spoke in parables. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. If we go back to the very beginning, uh, uh, in Genesis. God created a perfect earth and all the animals. It was all perfect, and there was no death of any kind. The animals were not carnivorous. There were no meat-eating animals. They were all uh, uh, grass-eating animals. And her we would say they are herbivorous animals. And it's only because death entered the world because of the sin of Adam that many of the animals like the saber-toothed tiger and, and lions and so on that would be car become carnivorous began to uh, exist. And here God is speaking spiritually about what happens uh, when we become saved and how it's going to be throughout eternity. It is not using, it's not saying whereas it's using the picture of animals, that there will be animals there. It is simply indicating that the there will be no more death of any kind. And so he says in verse 25, the wolf and the lamb shall, shall feed together. 
that's impossible today. If you stuck a wolf and a lamb in a in a uh, uh, corral someplace, uh, the next day you would only find a wolf and a and a dead lamb. Uh, and the lion shall eat straw like the bull. Uh, like in other words, the uh, the uh, the uh, lion no longer would be trying to eat any meat or kill any animals. It's, it's the herbivorous. In other words, we have conditions here that are pointing to the way it was before sin entered into the world. Uh, the way, uh, another way we could say it, in a new heaven and a new earth, there will be no more sin, no more death. It is not giving us any instruction about animals being in the new heaven and the new earth. We don't have any indication of that in the Bible. Uh, if, 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 if it is true, that's something God, that God still has to reveal when we get there. But at this point, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us about animals in the new heaven and the new earth. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. Yes, hello. Um, I was just wondering. I was just wondering. How how do we know that Jesus? Excuse died? me. Would you be kind enough to turn your radio off? That will help our caller, our call. Right. Okay. Go ahead with your question. How do we know of Jesus God if no one's ever seen God before? If if no one has can see God. Well, now, that you're, you have asked a very good question. Uh, the Bible does emphasize that nobody can see God and live, and, uh, and yet Christ was the eternal God in every sense of the word, and yet all kinds of people saw him. All kinds of people saw him. And uh, the, uh, we finally get an illustration of what it means to really see God as it is, Moses was up on Mount Sinai and God said, I'm going to show you my glory because Christ in his, in, or God in his full glory is, is way, way beyond what, uh, and yet that's an integral part of, of what God is. And so he hid Noah in a cave in the cleft of the rock. The Bible uses that language. And then God passed by in his glory. And all that Noah saw was just the edge, just the backsides of his glory, not in any sense the full glory of God. And it affected Moses to such a high degree that the reflected glory on Noah's, on Moses' face, uh, did I say no, I meant Moses' face, uh, as he came down Mount Sinai was so brilliant that he had to cover it with a veil because the Israelites could not look at him. And that was only because he was just uh, present in the, and seeing just the edge of God's glory. So when Christ came, and Christ and God appeared at various times to people, but when he never did show himself in his full glory, because had he done that, the person would have been destroyed by the enormous glory of God. But thank you. But that did not mean for a second that Christ was not eternal God in every sense of the word, but, but God, uh, God uh, uh, presented himself as with a human nature which he had been given and... Uh, and uh, uh, and did not present himself in his full glory, even though he was eternal God in every sense of the word. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. <coughs> Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, it says, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 15, If a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then why do you say that a man can only take on one wife? 
Well, because I, when Deuteronomy 21, verse 15 was written, the Bible was not yet complete. And sometimes God made statements earlier in the Bible that later on he modified or gave additional information concerning that changed the meaning of that particular verse because uh, the Bible is a whole Bible and and everything uh, has to be uh, uh, coordinated or, or has to be... Uh, uh, searched out in the light of everything else. And when, for, uh, for example, in Matthew 19, uh, where Christ is speaking that uh, that um, uh, what God has joined together shall not be put asunder, or when he spoke in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, where he said the wife is bound to her husband as long as he liveth, and other passages, uh, we began to begin to see that by the time we come to the end of the Bible, it was very clear that God's teaching was one man, one wife. The two became flesh. Uh, and uh, it does not, uh, the, while it, uh, earlier on it was not as clear, it, uh, there were some statements, but they weren't always that clear. But by the time we have the whole Bible, and that's what we've had for 2,000 years about, uh, we know that it's one man, one wife, and that's why... Uh, that is normally what has been practiced throughout the history of the world, with, of course, plenty of exceptions because of man's lust. Okay, then where did he change it? Thank. Where did he change? Well, for example, in uh, Jesus is eternal God, and he, when he spoke in Matthew 19, for example, he is laying down the law. The whole Bible is the law of God. And he's saying, for example, For this reason shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. He does not speak about their, they three or they, uh, however, whatever number. They, t it is a man and a wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And uh, so it's very clear that that was God's intention and that goes and in fact he ties it all the way back to the beginning he says uh, in uh, verse 4 of uh, Matthew 19 have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and so on in other words he's, he's now God is now making a special point Look all the way, the way it began. Adam did not have two wives or three wives. God gave him one wife, Eve. That was it. That set the line. Then, because of the uh, God had not uh, reinforced that any longer, mankind began to rebel against that, and and uh, some began to have more than one wife, and and God did not really. Uh, 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 pay much, uh, uh, a whole lot of attention to that until we get to a passage like Matthew 19 where God becomes very specific. So we, in our day, and during the last 2,000 years, have absolutely no basis of any kind for more than one wife, uh, for one husband. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, so thank you. I was just wondering, uh, where does the name Jehovah, where does that originate from and the spelling of it? Where does the name Jehovah come from? Well, you see, the problem is that in the Old Testament, uh, God, uh, God uh, gave... Uh, 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 at least uh, well, several names for God one was Elohim uh, uh, or, or it could be pronounced Allahim uh, he also gave the name uh, that could be pronounced Allah uh, or, uh, from the th three Hebrew letters from which it came although the translators I uh, translated in, uh, in the Aramaic in the original language in was, which it was written. This is particularly in the book of Daniel and in the book of Ezra. 
it could be pronounced Allah in the, Amer in the Aramaic language. Uh, but in our English language, it was translated God uh, because that, uh, uh, that uh, is obviously, uh, uh, the context clearly shows that that name is, is talking about God and, and God is, is a word that God uses elsewhere in the Bible. Now, but then... Uh, when uh, uh, when there is another name uh, that is found over 7,000 times and it is entirely different Hebrew letters than what uh, could had been translated as God and or as Lord and uh, and it uh, it should be pronounced, and we don't really know. Nobody knows today how it was pronounced in the original Hebrew. It could be pronounced Yahweh, or it could be now be pronounced Jehovah. These are two possibilities. But the Jewish nation had decided, not because of what the Bible said, but they just had decided that the word Jehovah, or Yahweh, was so holy that they should never pronounce it. That is not an instruction that they received from the Bible. But in order to, uh, 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 in order to make sure that nobody would try to pronounce it, when they wrote their version of the Bible, they changed the word to L O R D in the English language, but to uh, to indicate that. They, uh, it was, it was from the word Jehovah. They capitalized all four letters. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So when the King James translators and most of the translators of the new, of the Bible, uh, came to the word Yahweh or, Je or, uh, or, uh, uh, Jehovah, however it should be pronounced, nobody really knows. They put the word Lord there, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Why they did that is only because they were, uh, it was out of deference to the Jewish position. And, uh, but why they should have uh, uh, done that that way, I, uh, there was no reason at all to. It is the word Jehovah, or it is the word Yahweh. So, therefore, that's why when I read the Bible, I read the word that is translated L-O-R-D, all capitalized, and I read the word Jehovah, because that is the way it was originally uh, written by God, or I could say Yahweh. I, I don't know which way is the better way to pronounce it. It's not important, except that I'm not trying to make it a different word, because Lord is quite a different word from from uh, Jehovah, and, uh, and there is another word, that Hebrew word, that uh, that is correctly translated Lord, but in that case, uh, the translators just spelled capital L, and then lowercase o-r-d. So, but uh, if we're going to be consistent and try to be as close to the original as possible, it is it is absolutely right when we see that. For those four letters, L-O-R-D, all capitalized, to read that Jehovah. And that's what I do all the time. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Great. Could you go to uh, Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 and 4? Revelation chapter 11. 11 verse 3 and 4 and I will give power unto my two witnesses uh, or I will give unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth now what is your question yeah, I just want to note that we're only seven months away till the 21st of May next year. That why are these uh, witnesses flying around right now, warning everybody else about the you know pending doom that's getting ready to happen on May 21st? And I'll take your answer off the air. Thanks. 
why are these witnesses flying around warning everyone else? Well, they, uh, that, this is not during these 1,203 score days. That is, uh, remember Christ spoke in parables, and this 1,260 days is equivalent to three and a half uh, 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 years, three and a half years, no, three, yeah, three and a half years, and that three and a half is the whole New Testament era that in actuality was 19, or the whole church age rather, uh, that was exactly 1955 years, and then uh, the final great tribulation again is spoken of as 42 months, so we get the 42 months of the church age added to the 40 months, two months of the great tribulation, and we have exactly seven years symbolically, spiritually, not actually, of course. And so when we are, are as our caller said, flying around, that is, we are trying to tell the whole world we're living during not this 1260 days, we're actually living uh, during the uh, period that is uh, spoken of in verse 2, when the holy city shall be, they tread down 40 and 2 months. That three and a half years is typifying the present 23 years or 8,400 days that make up the time of the great tribulation. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping, how you doing? How you doing? Mr. Camping? Very well, thank you. What is your question? All right, my question is, in Luke 3 and in Matthew 1, why isn't Amos, I mean, Abel's name mentioned? Why is Abel, isn't no. Abel mentioned? Correct. Be not mentioned in that list, and I know because it's a kingly line. But because this is giving the genealogical line of of uh, Christ in in uh, Luke, and in the genealogical line of Joseph, his stepfather, in Matthew, both beginning. Uh, well, no. In Matthew chapter one, it doesn't. Be, it begins with with uh, Abraham, I believe. In Matthew chapter one, let me just, let me see if I remember that accurately. In Matthew one, it starts out. The genealogical line starts out uh, Abe with Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and so on. That that goes the genealogical line from Abraham to. Joseph, the stepfather of, of Jesus. On the other hand, Luke's gospel, in Luke 3, it starts out with God and goes through Adam, and then uh, through the next ca uh, calendar patriarch. Uh, and let me see, how does it, how does, let's look at that a minute. In Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, We see, uh, yes, it goes through Seth, from Adam uh, through Seth, and then from Seth through Enosh, and uh, these were not the firstborn sons of, uh, like Adam, or like Seth was not the firstborn Seth, uh, son of Adam, uh, but he was the one who's the next on the genealogical line, and uh, this is the way God has given it to us. Uh, in Matthew 1 and that's why Abel doesn't fit into that he he was just a son of Adam and he had and Cain was a son and any and he had other sons in addition okay. but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yes hello um, I was wondering and I forgot on what part of the Bible but it says uh that you shouldn't follow the traditions of men. I was wondering, does that apply to the traditions of this day and age? They should not follow the traditions of men. Well, yes, because uh, if the traditions of men are are the Bible, and that can be called the traditions in 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 
in some cases it is it's talking about the Bible that of course is, is valid because the Bible is the authority but wherever the Bible has been whether in the nation of Israel from the very a time that the Bible began to be written on Mount Sinai that's really the time when the written copy of the Bible began to develop or whether it had to do with the New Testament any part of it whenever it was written uh, theologians would examine what had been written and then they would put their thinking as to how to understand this or that rather than carefully uh, tr uh, examining it all together in the light of the Bible itself and oftentimes their thinking was not correct and uh, yet they because they were noted theologians they became authorities with their ideas and they be really just became the traditions of men that presumably were based on the Bible but were actually not at all accurately based on the Bible and so traditions uh, crept in and and yet they were because they were offered by outstanding theologians uh, who were looked upon as outstanding uh, therefore they became also very authoritative and yet it's nothing that we should take in or take seriously at all but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum uh, hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I have uh, um, a question or two concerning Second Corinthians uh, four. Second Corinthians chapter four. Yes. Uh, and which on, verse? Verse starting on verse three, all the way up to verse uh, four. Three and four. There we read. But if our gospel be hid. It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, yes. what, what is your question? Uh, yes, I always understood or, or was under, under the end under the understanding that the God of this world is uh, Satan because the Bible says that Satan is the prince of this world. And uh, I heard you uh, say a few couple of weeks ago that, um, the, that this verse is referring to God himself, not Satan. Well, you know, the... Uh uh, I'm sure that this has been a very common understanding uh, that the God of this world in this context is talking about Satan. But yet when we read a passage like Mark 4, Mark chapter 4, we discover something different. We find there where God is saying, uh, and uh, we, we read there, and he said unto them in verse 11, as the uh, disciples are, the, are asking for an understanding about the, uh, about the parables that Christ was t uh, using in, as a teaching tool, and, and uh, in verse 10 it says, And when he was alone, that is alone with his disciples, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. He had just told them the parable of the sower that went out to sow. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, that is those who are not elect of God, and uh, therefore they have never had their sins paid for before the foundation of the world, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear, and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and sins should be forgiven them. But yeah, you see, in other words, God is saying he himself has orchestrated this, he has designed this, so that 
uh, only those who were the elect of God would really understand truth, and only they would understand truth as God opened their spiritual eyes. And Satan uh, has no way of... of uh, this we don't read anywhere in the Bible where Satan. He it is true we read in Second Corinthians eleven. He comes as an angel of light, and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But that's only been happening since the beginning of the Great Tribulation, about twenty-two years ago. Satan was not ruling in the churches, for example, uh, at the very beginning. It was only uh, Christ who was ruling. We have to break right now. Remember in uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we read, let me turn to that a minute, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we read where God is talking about our day, for example, when, when uh, men are being prepared for, uh, where the world is being prepared for judgment day. And he says in, uh, in uh, verse... Uh, uh, for in verse 11 and for this cause God shall send them strong delusions that they shall believe a lie that's not that's not Satan the God of the, the, that God himself shall send them strong delusions that is they will uh, they will uh, be, uh, think they have the truth and they're not even close to the truth. It's the opposite of what he does for the true believers when he opens our spiritual eyes. And so the God of this world is Christ. Uh, it's, uh, the, Satan is called the prince of this world. He's not called the God of this world. I don't think any other place. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Farm. Yes. Um, I wanted you to look at Joel 2.31 and Joel 3.35. Let's look at that. Joel 2.31. Joel. Oh. Amos. Joel my hair. Joel 2.31 The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of, Jeho of Jehovah come. And then 3.35 We read No, there is no 3.35, Joel. 3 What, 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 what other oh, verse? I thought it was 3.35 You said there's Joel 3, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's 15, oh, <laughs> sorry. Three. Joel 3, verse 15? 15, yeah. Okay. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And Jehovah shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heaven and the earth shall shake. Yeah, well, and what is your question? Well, in Joel 2.31, the moon into blood, which I guess would mean it look it will look red, and in Joel 3.15, the moon is darkened. Well, um, they're, what they're, do you think is the difference? Or why the difference? They're both figures of speech speaking about the same event. The moon in the Bible, if it has any spiritual or uh, meaning, is talking about the law of God. The law of God. And... Uh, and when it is uh, turned into blood, it means it is bringing judgment. Uh, when it is not shining, it is talking about the fact that the gospel has been silenced. It is the true gospel isn't found anymore. And the uh, sun is shining, uh, the sun is withdrawn and shining simply means that there's no more gospel. And so when the, when, uh, Judgment Day begins. This is talking about what's going to happen when Judgment Day begins. The uh, 
true, but there will be no gospel anymore. Nobody can become saved. The, bl- the sun will stop shining, spiritually speaking. The moon will stop shining, spiritually speaking. It's because the law of God has everything to do with, with God's gospel message. But at the same time, when it can also be said that the law of God still exists as God is bringing judgment on those who are in, in the day of judgment. And therefore, in that sense, the, bl- the moon has turned to blood. Well, in Luke twenty one twenty five, it says that signs will be in the sun and the moon. Can it also be spiritual and physical? No, that this as, actually... it will not be physical. It will be spiritual altogether. The signs are in, the, in what is happening. We will know that we're at the end. We know that Christ is, has, is coming, we're at, or, or the, that Christ has come, that judgment day is here. There, there's no think... evidence, yeah. excuse me, there's no evidence in the Bible that I've been able to find that has anything to do with with uh, 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 physical uh, uh, activity in the sun or the moon, uh, that it, uh, because it, it talks about the the uh, uh, day continuing all the way till judge, the end of Judgment Day, October 21. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. I have been listening to your um, uh, open forum now for about a month, and I I just have one question. Um, what do you do with the verse that says that nobody knows the day nor the hour? That is a very, very valid teaching for the time of the church age. If you look at... Acts chapter 1, verse 7, you'll find there that the disciples who were the beginning of the New Testament church asked a question about the timing of the end, and Christ told them very flatly, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. In other words, I'm not going to tell you uh, uh, when the end will be, uh, but you get busy, uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing now, and you have to bring the gospel to the ends of the world. And so God repeated that in many places in Matthew 24, for example, and in Mark 13 and elsewhere, that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. You cannot know. But once the church age was finished, and that was finished, uh, uh, 22 years ago, then God uh, begins to talk about uh, th- that we will know because he has given command in Ezekiel, both in Ezekiel 3, in Ezekiel 18, and in Ezekiel 33, I believe it is, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, the true believers have to warn the world that judgment day was coming, and if we if we uh, we can't warn unless we have the time, and so God has given us a lot of information, so that finally during this last few years we've been able to very accurately learn what the time is, and then He has indicated, for example, in in First uh, Thessalonians chapter five, that while those who still believe that he's coming as a thief in the night, but they're not worried because they are in peace and safety, a, ju- a sudden destruction will come upon them. Oh, my, that's judgment day. But then he says, but ye are not in darkness, brethren, that that would surprise you as a thief. You are the children of the light. And uh, they, you are watching. And we watch by examining the Bible very carefully. And... Uh, and in God's own timetable, he's shown us when the time would be so that we could faithfully carry out the commands of Ezekiel that we are to warn the world that Judgment Day, the time when the Judgment Day would be here. It all fits together very beautifully. But I understand you gave dates earlier that 
it didn't happen. Well, the fact is that we know it will happen because it has all come from the Bible and God has given us magnificent proofs. Uh, for example, God has clearly demonstrated there are 7,000 years from the time of the flood until, uh, until the time of the judgment day and uh, that's exactly the way it has worked out as we've walked through the Bible as God guided us in understanding how to uh, all of this so we know that it's absolutely going to happen and if if uh, people keep calling me trying to say well what if it doesn't happen what they're really asking me is you know we're trying to tempt you into not trusting the Bible. Well, I do trust the Bible implicitly. The Bible guarantees it will happen. And so I can't, count, I, I don't pay any attention to those kind of calls because it is going to happen. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Yeah. yeah, can we go to Romans 11? Uh, verse uh, 24, 25. Let's go to Romans 11, verse 24 and uh, 25. There we read, but For if thou wert out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now, what is the... What is the uh, could, question? Could you explain those verses for me, please? Well, yes. You see, God here is teaching that uh, that there is the possibility of salva salvation all the way till Judgment Day. That's when uh, we're to occupy until He comes, and and He's coming on Judgment Day. That's when. That's also the day of the completion of God's salvation plan when all the believers are caught up to be with Christ. And, uh, and he is saying that, uh, there, that in as so far as the nation of Israel is concerned, and remember, in 1948, they became a nation again, almost miraculously. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we would expect them that, uh, my, uh, they would have... Uh, recognize Jesus as something important in their nation because even though they disagreed with the theology of Jesus they would have to recognize that he's made a powerful impact upon the on uh, many aspects of this world and yet they don't absolutely don't want him as their as their uh, messiah uh, at all except there are a trickle of Jews that are becoming saved and that's why it says blindness, in part, has happened to Israel. It's been that way uh, all through the history of Israel. Uh, most of the people ha of Israel had no interest in Christ at all as their Messiah. But there's always been a little remnant chosen by grace that did become believers. And God is saying this is the way it's going to be right up until Judgment Day till the fullness of the Gentiles come in. As long as the gospel is going out and non-Jews are becoming saved, and that will go on until the, the, just before the day of judgment, uh, this will be the condition in national Israel. So that all of these uh, pre, uh, preachers and evangelists and so on are still, are, who are still looking for some grand thing to happen to national Israel that they would finally, God would demonstrate that they are his people and and uh, there would be a great uh, awakening, spiritual awakening, is not going to happen. Uh, they've already been in their own land now for 62 years and they're mm -hmm. not any closer uh, to wanting Jesus as their Messiah than they were ever in their history. 
Okay. Uh, uh, is this volume three talking about uh, Revelation eleven? The same volume three? Uh, 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 the two witnesses? The, no, no, no. That's a different subject altogether. Oh, okay. That's it. And so, oh. thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, am I on the air? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. What is your question? Wonderful. I wanted to ask, uh, Romans 10, 9, where it mentions, um, and the, for those who confess with their mouth and believe in their heart shall be saved, would not this guarantee, or would not this give many of your listeners assurance of salvation? If you could read that, I believe it's Romans 10, 9. Oh, well, but uh, we have to remember, it says, uh, uh, let me read the verse. All right. We read that of, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The big question is, we can't just... We just can't look at that and say, well, it's plain as day. It's the same. Plain as the big nose in my face that God is telling us that's all you have to do is believe on him. The big question is, how will I believe on him? Because that's a work. The Bible says faith is work. And believing is, a, is the uh, verb form of, of the noun believing, uh, of faith, rather. And the Bible is crystal clear that it says faith is work. And uh, and only Christ, uh, his faith is what was required to save us. He did all the work, and so uh, if it's if it, if if we uh, are going to really be saved, it has to be because Christ has uh, d done all the work to save us, and therefore, as a result of God saving us, then the good work of of believing and all any other good works will be manifested in our life but that not but because we believed in christ uh, and it was our faith that we were believing or that we think god gave us uh, that that cannot be because that's work that we do that's an impossibility but brother aren't we saved by grace through faith aren't we saved by Grace, yes, and grace is the gift of God by Christ. By, you know, you're quoting from Ephesians chapter 2, and it's a beautiful verse. It really says it. For by Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Whose faith? Christ. That is, through Christ. And that not of yourself, that already agree, it tells us it, that faith has nothing to do with what you, what you manifested. It is what Christ has done. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is 100% the gift of God. And there is nothing that we can do or that can help us to become saved. As a matter of fact, when we really work through this, through the whole Bible, we find that if we are trusting that I did this or I did that, I accepted Christ or I first believed in him because God gave me the faith to believe in him or anything of that nature, it is guaranteed that we are not saved. We are violating the law of God that we're trusting in a work that we have done and it's the Bible is clear it's not of works lest any man should boast and so on all right well it was an honor to speak to you I'm a first-time caller and you have a blessed evening Bye. thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hi mr. camping how are you very well thank you I have a question for you, sir. I'd like to find out an update on the um, RV caravan. I know you had mentioned that you thought they might be leaving today, October 21st, so I just wanted to check in with you. No, we're not quite ready. We're trusting that our 
Uh, hopefully Monday. Now, today it's raining, and I don't know what that has to do with it. It might delay us a day or two. You know, it's all in God's hand. We uh, we uh, propose, and God disposes, and uh, so we're waiting upon Him. But we've made a lot of progress. We're having... Uh, it's a, we're very excited about this whole thing, and but uh, it has to be done uh, very carefully, and 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 you know, there's a there's a statement in the Bible that we uh, from which we get the phrase, the Lord willing, we we will be going out uh, May twenty uh, or Monday, the Lord willing. It may not be the Lord wills if it, it may take a day or two longer but anyway we're getting very absolutely. close absolutely sir you are so right and God bless you and God bless family radio we're a long time listener and we just praise the Lord for you every single day sir you have a great evening thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yes good evening Mr. Capping yeah. I have uh, two verses I'd like you to look at, and then I'll ask you my question. Um, the first verse is John six twenty nine. John uh, sec- six, verse twenty nine. Luke John six, verse twenty nine. There we read. There we read, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now, what is your other verse? And the other verse is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. We read... And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Now, what is your question? Now, my question is, we know that we're saved through the faith of Christ, and that um, back in 1988, um, I believe it was 1988, the, um, the book of Daniel, the little book, was unsealed, and I believe that that's when this verse really, the truth of this verse, verse really became made known. I'm correct about that, am I not? Yes, you are correct about that. It identifies with the last uh, chapter of Second Chronicles where it talks about the day of the Great Tribulation, uh, the time of the Great Tribulation. Uh, uh, the uh, There will be the joy of the... Uh, the glory of the seventh day Sabbath. Let me see. Let me turn to that and see how that language goes. I haven't looked at that for a while. In uh, Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-six or so, we read where it says, um, Second Chronicles. Uh, verse uh, 21, uh, chapter 36, verse 21, uh, the land hath, in, uh, or it's talking about the uh, the uh, great tribulation that occurred to uh, to uh, uh, Judah. That was a type or picture, a portrait of the great tribulation of our day, the 23-year period that uh, we are presently getting right near the end. It's exactly 8,400 days. And it says that during that period, the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years, three score and 10 years. That was in the case of Judah. Now, in, in its completion of this prophetic statement, that 70 years that Israel was under the Babylonian heel uh, uh, rule, typified the 23 years that we presently are coming to an end of as uh, Satan is ruling in the churches. Christ has placed him there. And it's at that time that the land enjoys her Sabbath. That is, 
Uh, the seventh day Sabbath has everything to do as a sign pointing to the fact that Christ did all the work to save us. And so God is saying that during this great tribulation period, the land is enjoying its Sabbath. That is, we are been teaching, we've been able to teach, we've, God has opened our eyes so that we're able to teach that it all has to do with God's work and has nothing at all to do with anything we have done so that the world is hearing it very correctly that we can't get ourselves saved, that there's no plan that we can offer as to how we can become saved as every church has in, uh, in mind they all have a plan of some kind as to how you can become saved and none of that is possible if the land is going to if the kingdom of god is going to enjoy its sabbath it has to be a, a sabbath it has to be salvation that is entirely faithful to the word of god but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our last call please Welcome to Open Forum. How are you doing, Brother Camping? Thank you. Yes, uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. Genesis 8, verse 21. Let's look at that. Genesis 8. Genesis 8, verse 21. We read, And Jehovah smelled a sweet savor. And Jehovah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Now, what is your question? Yes, uh, what is that verse uh, explaining, basically? Yeah, well... We have to remember that everything in the Bible is conditioned by everything else in the Bible. That's why we are to always compare Scripture with Scripture. If we only had right. this verse, we'd have to say, well, then God will never destroy this world again. And all that we're understanding about Judgment Day coming is that we, we've, we've made a grand mistake of some kind. But God has more to say. If we go to Genesis chapter, uh, chapter, uh, uh, the 16, 9 verse 16, uh, he says, I, uh, and the bow, the rainbow that is, will be in the heaven, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And, uh, uh, then he says uh, in verse 15, And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. In other words, God defines what he said in the earlier verse in Genesis. But shall we have, we have to say good night? Yes, 